James Hill, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Uh, we're really happy to, to have you on board. Um, you are currently on the advisory board of several consumer goods companies in the food industry particularly, and you have a long-standing career in driving business growth financially, as well as overseeing company culture transformations. Indeed. In the early 2000s, uh, you were in charge of two companies that were part of Unilever Group. And the first company was Lever, which was then transitioned to Lever Fabergé. Um, which is now Unilever UK Home and Personal Care. And the second company was Bird's Eye Walls, which later on became Unilever Ice Cream and Frozen Food. In both of these companies, you also implemented an arts and business program called Catalyst, which is what we will primarily focus on today in trying to answer the question of how art as a method can help solve business challenges. So thank you and welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Alex. Great. Well, let's start with the, with the business context uh, and the wider set, setting, so to say. What was the situation for the unit you were leading at the time uh, at Unilever, um, the first company, Lever? And uh, what were you looking for at the time to ensure that the business thrives? Uh, well, the the two main drivers of the Catalyst program at the beginning were, were firstly uh, to prepare the ground for an impending merger of the company I was running, which you mentioned was Lever, with a sister company, which was called uh, then Elida Fabergé. Um, and I was very determined uh, and so did become the, uh, the leader of the other company that rather than having a kind of a lowest common denominator merger or a conflicting merger where uh, there were invidious comparisons between the two. Uh, we would jointly try to actually build uh, a new vision, which was better than either existing company, that everybody in both companies could aspire to and, and drive towards. And we thought that uh, the arts offered such scrutiny of, uh, of the human condition um, and of the challenges, uh, the, the sort of the emotional challenges and the practical challenges of bringing two different cultures together, uh, we thought that would be an excellent way of exploring uh, the issues around the merger, breaking the ice and helping to lay the ground for what eventually was a successful uh, fusion of these two units. So that was one driver. And the second driver was that although both of these companies were doing pretty well, they were both profitable and they were they were, they were growing modestly. Um, I had the ambition to raise the bar further and in particular to improve the growth rate of the company. Um, uh, I think you mentioned it was a consumer packaged goods company and the construction of brands and uh, the promotion of those brands through advertising and pack design uh, is an intrinsic part of the business success model and innovation. And I thought that we could leverage the power of the arts um, to trickle down the capabilities in uh, dramatization, film and theater, the impact that would have on advertising, um, the impact of the visual arts on, uh, on packaging design, making things appealing and, and uh, uh, communicative. Um, and that basically, and really opening people's minds more to, to doing things in different ways, which I think the art is a great stimulus for, that by doing that, we could improve the growth rate of the company. So a merger on the one hand, making sure that was a success, and on the other hand, or uh, equally importantly, to grow the growth rate of the company through better marketing and better innovation. Yeah, so it sounds like it was um, an inside the company effect of the program and also outside the company, like you said, through communications and marketing. So the influences on the people um, inside the company then also were translated into maybe better artwork for your advertising and for your marketing and where- Indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, I really saw it as a developmental program for, uh, for the people in the organization, uh, a way of helping them to raise the bar, to raise their sights, to be ready to embrace change, the inevitable changes that were to come, and, uh, and to have a kind of a different insight into the influences that they could call upon to improve the standard of their work. Great. How did you come about arts 
uh, as a method or, or um, yeah, merging arts and business. It's not a very um, well-beaten track, so to say, or, or path. Um, could you give us a little bit more context? How, how did this begin? Yeah. Um, I think it, I, was, I was lucky that the, the, the divisions that I were running were part of uh, a big, big blue chip company called Unilever. Uh, a UK and Dutch based multinational and they have for they had and have for many years sponsored the arts um, as basically out of altruism or as part of their overall kind of communications and uh, CSR uh, responsibilities they did that and that that brought me into uh, exposure with the arts the high arts in a way that I never really had through my education and grounding I, I came from a much more sort of kind of humble background, if you like, um, had, a, had a very uh, rational education um, focused on uh, competitiveness and, and numeracy and uh, hard, hard work and uh, the values of, of prudence and uh, financial rigor. And, and I, was, I was already, you know, reasonably, you know, I, I'd done okay in the company through those kind of value sets. But through, through the, the group's association with the high ups, I began to see that there was this whole other side, I don't want to polarize it, but uh, kind of left brain side to do with uh, creativity, emotion, uh, diversity, and the, the profoundness of that and the importance of that really was, was coming home to me. And I thought, well, if, the, if this can provoke, if this can open my mind, I was already in my, I don't know what, my mid or late thirties, if this can open my mind, then it can maybe open everybody's minds and help everybody to, to develop a full persona, not just a one-sided persona. So that, that was really why the other, other clever people had already supported the arts. And I, I could see this trickle down effect from the high arts into the kind of industry I was working in. Yeah, it's very interesting to find out more about the effect that the arts have on people because I think um, yeah a lot of business leaders and also a lot of people who maybe have been more on the art side um, see the effects uh, once, kind of once you open the door you see the effect of it but you have to be a little open and then you kind of embrace like you said uh, new attitude or maybe a new kind of uh, perspective. Yes, indeed. Um, can you describe Catalyst as a program for us? So, because you employed a lot of different kinds of arts, so it wasn't really unilateral and it ran for many years, you said about 10, uh, 10 years or seven years? Yeah, something like that, seven to 10 years. I can't remember exactly. So that's quite long term. Can you describe yeah at least in in um, overview big picture um what the program was well i think the very first thing i i this might not be an exhaustive list because over those years there were more than a hundred uh, different uh, activities or interventions or events or something that that were within the umbrella branding of catalyst it started off with the purchase of a uh, a small contemporary art collection with which we would adorn uh, our building and the building that would be shared by the two companies that were merging. Um, so we didn't spend a great deal of money, but some of the young people who there were a couple of art, ex art students in the company and they, uh, we gave them a modest budget. They went out and, and bought uh, some uh, modern art paintings. By the way, we made a profit on that as well because um, they bought very wisely. Good for business in every way. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and we, we used to have discussions and events about uh, one painting per week or something in turn, uh, inviting different people to come along. Uh, sometimes we were able to get the artists to come along. Uh, and that provoked uh, a very kind of exciting and different dialogue. Uh, that, that was one intervention and that went on. So the use of the visual arts to inform a debate about uh, the message that was behind the piece of art, uh, firstly, but also the actual um, artistic techniques, um, the use of light, uh, use of contrast, um, foreground, background. You know, I'm, I'm not an artist, but 
the, the, the use of that, the analogies between that and our own pack design was an obvious connection for us to make. So that, that would be one. Then theatre was an important part of it um, because we, uh, we were making a lot of advertising uh, to support our brands. And therefore, again, the linkage between a theatrical performance and a 30 second piece of advertising, the components of that, the messaging in that, uh, that, that was obvious and easy to make. But we also use theatre in order to explore the interactions within, within the company itself. So, for example, the annual performance review, I'm picking sporadic examples, the annual performance review of the individuals, that was always a very uh, sort of an exciting moment, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And I remember we ran an event where we had actors doing role play of uh, the characteristic uh, appraisal, we called it an appraisal interview, the characteristics of appraisal interviews done well and done badly. And through theatrical role play, uh, we sort of educated or helped people to experiment with different ways of saying things, different ways of, of doing things. So that, that, was, that was an example uh, that we used, which was really memorable. Uh, we actually engaged a, a poet. There was a program running in the UK called Poet in Residence. You, you may have heard that, where uh, a real life poet is invited to uh, visit an organization or to join, have a kind of secondment to an organization and to reflect on that organization through the poetry. Uh, and we did that too. And some of the some of the works uh, and the observations and insights that that person brought, I thought, were really, really fascinating. And kind of the arts does this generally. It helps it helps to open up a dialogue that you might never otherwise have had. Um, both the courage and the creativity and the non-judgmental uh, characteristics, usually of art, are quite liberating. Uh, by compar especially by comparison with the rather structured and rigid ways that businesses, even the most successful businesses. Uh, tend to organize themselves and indeed have to organize themselves. So the poet in residence was another input. Um, music, uh, also music uh, in, in our advertising, that was great. What else? Yeah, some, some of it was training and some of it was discussion and some of it was meetings. You know, we had uh, events around running meetings and how, how to do that well, how to do that badly. Using examples, drawing upon analogies from, uh, from the arts world. So I think there are some of the things that, uh, that I come to mind, but there was another one, meeting spaces, for example. <laughs> this wasn't our most successful, but we, we managed, there was a, a pond outside one of our buildings and it occurred to somebody to get a life raft, a life raft with the orange top and the black sort of rubber ring and float it on the pond and people would have meetings in it. Um, and we had, we had uh, there was a whole program to do with using uh, different meeting spaces because the, the set and the context often changes the way that you have a conversation. You know, mm -hmm. here we are now digitally and in a Zoom and it's all kind of sure. um, the way it is. But if we were sitting in a life raft having this conversation, it would be somewhat different. And some, and some of that is opens people up. There was a kind of a, a general management sort of tendency there to take, to in order to make progress on things, to take people out of their established environment and to take them out of their comfort zone, they would often say, mm -hmm. and put them into a different environment. And that would, that would make people drop their uh, pretentiousness. That would make them talk much more straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. um, that would somehow unite people. And the, the, life, the, the lifeboat on the pond was one example. So what All happened? That. What was the result of that? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very exciting. <laughs> I think it was exciting, but I think I think it was uh, perhaps it was a bit too much of a stretch for some people. We had a number of meetings took place in it, but I think it was a bit too gimmicky, and uh, I'm not sure if the effectiveness of the meetings in in the life raft were <laughs> quite what we would have hoped. Um, yeah, that that really, and not everything worked. That's an interesting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, recall point out of those hundreds, probably five or six fell really flat mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and invited criticism and, and they gave justification to the, to the, the doom sayers and the, the naysayers about the programme. Um, but I think one of the great things about it was 
program had the capacity to bounce back, you know, and, and the ops is like that. Not everything works or not everything works first time at that time. Um, but we were also, one of the great things, somebody said, that the thing about this program, he said, it just gives me, it gives me the license to be different. Mm-hmm. It had an impact on diversity. It gave me, it gave me a license to be different and to act differently and not to have to conform, copy, mimic the leaders of the moment because it was a, it was a, a mind broadening uh, set of interventions. So I think that, that the impact that it had on, on many of the people, not all, but many of the people, I think was one of the most rewarding parts of it. Yeah, not fitting into a box, but yeah. understanding and being able to be flexible in the, in the mindset. Yes, yes. But as I say, you know, I've perhaps not done justice to it because it's uh, finished more than 10 years ago now, but there were more than 100 different things. I've only mentioned, I think, yeah. five or six out of that 100. Uh, so, yeah. That's a remarkable uh, variation uh, (laughs) of different things to do. And of course, I think it's also important to fail and bounce back and and learn from it. And um, there's, I I think there will always be different opinions about things that you do, but Mm -hmm. then it's also important. I, I think you also mentioned it in a previous interview. It's important, or it was important for you at the time that um, people also stand against something together and that's somehow if it doesn't have a positive response then it builds um, yeah collegiality in a different way when you yes yes all against something mm-hmm. I think one of the other interesting aspects for me was that also in my own I'm, I, I'm still intrinsically you know a rational right-sided brain sort of prudent hard-nosed businessman, competitive and all of that. You know, that's still my default mode. Mm-hmm. So as part of that, you know, I was determined to measure this as much as, as I could. Um, a, to understand, but B, also to justify. Because if, if this, uh, you know, you're, you're playing with the shareholders' money and I had to, I had to be able to explain what we were doing here. Um, so we, we got feedback on every single event from the participants uh, we also looked at the impact of the uptake of the Catalyst program on the performance of different units because that was differential. Um, we looked at, uh, it, we, we, like most big companies, we did big, big employee surveys annually or, uh, or every two years where we analyzed morale, motivation, attitudes in, in a very sophisticated way. And we measured the impact or the apparent impact, the correlations between the Catalyst interventions and that. And, and overall, all the, uh, all the correlations that we did find were all positive. Uh, it's hard to isolate the variables because, you know, sure. if I, I, can run, I can run a very nice arts program on the one hand and then cut the salary 30% the week after. And, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the, the relative impact that they might have on you. So it's hard to be clear and absolutely precise, but we tried very, very hard to do that with this program. Uh, collected a huge amount of data and as I say the vast majority of it was was very positive and that indeed reinforced it that that converted the skeptics that enabled me to to say and I think with justification that this was being done not and this is one of the dangers of of, um, arts involvement by companies is it tends to be the plaything of the chief executive you know if I don't know if he if he's in, he or she is interested in the theatre, it's all about the theatre. Uh, if 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 she is a sailor, then they're sponsoring sailing yachts. If uh, if he if, if he was a rugby player when he was younger, then they're throwing the company's money into his old rugby club. And I really really thought I think that's wrong. It's almost unethical. Um, and one of the most rewarding things about this. Not, not that I was in that camp either. As I said, I didn't come from any artistic background, on the contrary. But it was very rewarding for me that even when I, my, I moved around eventually through that 10-year period and moved elsewhere, the thing had grassroots support and it continued. It wasn't, as, as so often the case, that when one leader goes, the initiative disappears with him or her. In this case, uh, this particular program, this initiative, you know, long, long, long outlasted me uh, and the, the other sort of relative co-founder of it, who was my, 
the unit head of the of the unit we were merging with. So I think that was that was great. That's really testament to the the real added value within the company. It wasn't self indulgent, or we didn't allow it to become self indulgent. It sounds like it was for the people and in time by the people also that they they participate. I mean the participatory nature in all of the different activities of the program that was essential I mean without it you don't have much right that's right but that's you know they say it's an awful cliche but they say that you know people are the biggest asset in business uh, mm-hmm. the brands are pretty important too <laughs> the brands can sometimes help the people and make the people but still um, you know this this really was about helping the people to grow helping them to adapt helping them to change stimulating them helping them to perform better you know how else how else can you improve an organization yeah people and processes and and this this you know using the analogy the um the comparative power of the arts almost in a non-threatening way helped help people to explore different things and and uh, find improvements in different parts of their work Yes, absolutely. And the people also sustain the brand. I mean, they're the brand's biggest. Indeed, they do. Indeed, they do. Indeed, they do. Starts there. So, yeah, everything is, is interrelated. Yeah. Um, so, you mentioned, um, I think it was also in one of your earlier interviews, uh, that many of these activities were voluntary. Um, mm. And that was also part of the success. Were all of the catalyst activities voluntary? And if so, how did you ensure that people had enough time to participate in in them? As I recall, all, everything was voluntary, um, or nearly everything. Now you do sometimes get peer pre- you get peer pressure, you get group pressure. So if we are in a department of six and uh, four of us think it's a good idea, then it's pretty hard for the other two not to join in, particularly if, if you're using the event to explore a dynamic on your brand or you know, in, in your business. Um, so I'm, uh, I would imagine there would, there would have been cases for people who were kind of dragged along, <laughs> sort of, but only by peer pressure. No, no, no. Uh, and I think that the arts is, is like that anyway, isn't it? The arts supports diversity of opinion, um, difference of view so so it's, it's great we we had i mean we we even you reminded me of the odd event as we go through you know we, we did have people we had a debate in favor and against the program and played that out in front of an audience so that we could get that uh get, get it all out into the open you know bring it bringing bringing opinions bringing thoughts bringing information into the public domain allows a team to actually form a better opinion overall about pros and cons of anything in life you know so but but the, the the mindset was yeah it's voluntary if you wanted to opt out there's more than one way to win if, if it wasn't for you or you weren't ready for it then that was absolutely fine um yeah and i, I think that's important yeah not to force everyone yeah otherwise you get you get the resistance in a different way yeah uh, yeah did you feel like uh, you mentioned this importance of, of discussing um, things that maybe are not in agreement and, and the importance of even conflict conversation? Mm-hmm. How do you assess the effect it had on the openness of the culture overall, especially in the two companies merging together? So do mm-hmm. you feel like every day working in the company was an open field of, of exploration that people could really um, say their opinions out loud? I think it helped. I, I really do think it helped. And we were, we were rather worried about the merger because there was rivalry, there was pre-existing rivalry and there, and there were kind of cultural differences between the organizations. Well, they were, they were perceived to be big differences, but by, the arts gave a platform for people to, from these different companies to come together and discuss an issue that wasn't uh, a right and wrong issue. It was simply a way of uh, exploring something, expressing one's opinion, um, yeah, looking at different sides of an argument. So that it really, it really helped in that respect. Uh, 
that's I've been distracted by that that remark from your, your sentiment of your original question. What, what was the question? Uh, yeah, no. If it helped to um, to open the conversation, or actually have a culture of openness and uh, a culture where people can state their opinion openly. For sure, no, for sure, absolutely, for sure. Yeah. And and it's helpful to do that about in a kind of a relatively non-threatening environment. Because mm -hmm. if I if I hold up my pack design to you, you know, and I say, well, what do you? Let's have a discussion. Let's have a discussion about the Garmin, you know, pack design. Mm -hmm. If I've invented it, then your comments upon it are, are very much conditioned by uh, your relationship with me and how you want to be perceived by me or how, how you want me to perceive you. Uh, you, may, you may not be honest. Uh, you may be unduly diplomatic. You, you may be pro provoked into a competitive response, you know. So it's much more helpful if you put up i don't know if you put up a painting uh and let's talk about that and it's so much more easy that that dialogue is more easy and you get then i, I kind of come to understand you and the merit of your point of view whether i agree with it or not and then the, the, the conversation next week about my pack design is somehow enabled by the conversation about that equally stimulating and interesting but neutral neutral subject so for sure uh, uh people were sometimes shocked to hear the way that other people looked at uh, pieces of art or the way that people would interpret a theatrical performance what they thought was good and what they thought was not good um i do remember another anecdote i'm sorry to shift around but um one of the most one of the humblest jobs in the whole company right it's, i'm talking about a big company here it, the, the combined company had a turnover of a billion euros it's a big big company with thousands of people in it and one of the one of the humblest head office jobs was uh the, the company driver so there was a driver you can imagine the guy 55 years old he's a great guy he used to drive anyone needs to be driven anyway he would drive and of course, he, he, when we put up this art collection, uh, he looked at one thing, which is just a set of lines on the wall. And he said, well, that's my five-year-old daughter could have done that. You know, that classic reminder. He said, this is absurd. He said, what is that? Did we actually pay money for that? You know, the classic, what is art type dialogue. And someone pointed out to him that if the light changed, then, and you looked at it in a particular way, it was like a kind of a Bridget Riley type uh, thing. If you looked at it in a particular way, then then another message came out of this, uh, this these lines, which were not absolutely uniform. There were minuscule variations. I said, oh, okay. But then the next time I happened to be passing and I heard him explaining this to someone else and how wonderful this <laughs> thing was. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, oh, that really is the best that he's gone this this guy has gone from that's a lot of nonsense you know my five-year-old daughter could have done this and he was proud by association <laughs> with the 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 intricacies and the nuance of this particular work of art and was boasting about it to other people and i thought oh well that's just great that's the kind of you know that's the kind of growth that's a microcosm of the impact that this thing can have yeah, yeah you just brought that you just brought that back to mind yeah, thanks for this anecdote. I think it, yeah, it speaks volumes of, well, we change a lot our perspectives and our views in life. And, and I think that's important in a business environment. And, and that's a yes. beautiful example of art facilitating that for anyone. In I agree. Because I think that, you know, coming back to the people thing, and without being too cloying and, and cliche laden, but, you know, art is uh, it's an exploration of the human condition more than it more than anything else um yeah. you know it's it's insight into us it's holding a mirror up to us often great art is asking us and through the conversation that it provokes whether that be a positive anger through the emotion that, that provokes it, it, it invites us and forces us to examine our own biases and prejudices and and motivations and I think that the more that we do that as individuals, um, the more effective we can be at understanding ourselves and understanding the other people around us. And I think that without being too, too sentimental about it, I think that genuinely, <laughs> that generally helps. 
you know, you, you can laugh at yourself also. You know, if you if you continually have a particular point of view on everything and and you're sharing that and everybody somehow points that out to you, you you then have to, yeah, there's a humility is brought to that. You realize that in the end, yeah, you're Mr. Negative or, or Mrs. Negative <laughs> or you're, you're eternally optimistic. You know, no matter what it is, you like it, you know. How useless is that? You like everything, you know. Can't you be brave enough to say you don't like something? So that, that kind of exploration of our, our different characters, I think is always valuable. And that was one of the important things in Catalyst. And that, the validation. And another aspect was the, um, I think I mentioned diversity. So I think, um, you know, business, one of the classic things is that business often compared to war, right? It's a war out there. So there's constant discussion about you know, competition, war, macho analogies, uh, go out and kill them. Yeah, yeah, get, get the big guns out. You know, it's all that, mm -hmm. which, which I, I love that, by the way. So that, that's very me. You know, I'm right out there. You know, let's go out there and, you know, how, how, how do you spell fun? W-I-N. You know, that's very me. <laughs> um, but... The, but it's not only, we, we started using different analogies. Uh, so it started being, you know, more poetic and artistic analogies. And what that did was, there was a very male bias in the company. That was one of the problems that we all had. It's extremely male biased, particularly in the leadership group. And all this macho, um, war-like war stuff was only reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. So when, when, the, when, when some of, leading by example, when, when some of the big senior people, most of whom were still men, by the way, uh, when they started using poetic analogies or quoting from uh, emotional parts of theatre as a way of making whatever point, I think that helped to legitimise uh, mm -hmm. that way of talking about things, which is often associated with being more feminine. I don't actually believe that it is, but it's somehow been pigeonholed in that way. So yeah, the, the softer, um, the more emotional, uh, the more conciliatory, um, and the more pragmatic viewpoints were more legitimized in part by the artistic uh, way of examining the world compared to that rather cliched, yeah, yeah competition and war. Yeah, it's interesting how they're often polarized, but they actually work the best together. Yeah, they coexist, indeed. indeed they do. Also, it's, it's been also often said that company culture, for example, or talking about people matters, it's more of soft stuff, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, and still, it is one of the hardest things to do, to really understand the others and build bridges and communicate and... Um, a lot of projects or, or businesses fail exactly because of that. So, indeed, they do. indeed they do. Yeah. Great to, to hear from your experience of, of how this happened, also organically in the company, because it's not so much about the program itself and you had this mm -hmm. um, theater exploration or, or this musical production, but, um, but really what it did for, for people and, and their behavior. Yes, yes. Um, okay, moving forward. Um, if you were to name um, the top three benefits for you as a business leader that this program brought to the company and the people, what would they be? Well, I think I mentioned earlier on the two main objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that in the main, they were both met. The, me the merger turned out to be a complete success and it was much more seamless than it would otherwise have been had it not, had it not been for the effect of Catalyst in bringing people together ahead of the merger uh, and helping them to open up and realize that the people on the other side of the merger were human beings and uh, yeah, had, had very valid ways of looking at the world. So um, that, that merger went really, really, really well. And I think that Catalyst was an important, not the only, but a very important contributor to that. Secondly, uh, the growth rate of the, com the company did improve. 
Um, it was already successful, as I said, it wasn't a complete turnaround, but objectively, I think we could feel that we were uh, taking more risks, that the standards of our um, briefs to agencies who were working on the advertising and pack design agencies, that was all improving as a result of the interventions that Catalyst had, uh, had made um, and the growth rate of the company went up. And some of the departments, again, it's very hard to be precise about the correlations, but some of the departments who had embraced it more earlier or more enthusiastically, um, they seem to be the most successful ones at, at generating an improvement. Um, so we were convinced that, that that was a positive contributor. Uh, and the third thing was the impact on the people that we've also touched on, just this sense that this sense of growth, this sense of uh, freedom and license to operate and, and diversity, that would be the third thing, that we became a more inclusive company. Uh, we were regarded as investing in people. It was people really thought in the main that this was for them and about them. And many, many of them grew as a consequence. Uh, I know one or two left the company to to join the arts community. <laughs> that was that was kind of shooting myself in the foot, really. Well, um, full conversion. <laughs> yeah, okay, but if that's the price of success, and and you know we probably recruited a couple of people from the arts community on the other side, so I was fine with that. So yeah, that would be it. So the merger work, the growth rate went up a bit, uh, and the personal growth, which was measured in the morale and motivation in these surveys, I talked about. And also, you know, 101 anecdotes about how it helped people to be more rich in the way they went about their work. Yeah, all of the three are really important for the business. They're directly. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't doing it for fun. We weren't yeah. doing it for fun. You know, it was, it, was, it was the day job. It was the day job. And coming back to that, by the way, it was 90% 90, 90 of it was done within working time. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, when it wasn't, it wasn't your leisure time, you know, it wasn't play time. No. So this, this was 90% was done during working time. Some, we had lunchtime lectures. That was quite a popular thing, actually. So we would, we would bring in different artists to talk about their works and, and some of that happened at lunchtime, but, but most of it didn't. Most of it happened during uh, the kind of the nine till five working period. There were other, uh, there were there were some evening events as well, but in the main, to facilitate this happening and to and to show that we were serious about the effect it had, it was uh, yeah, another way of working, another way of learning in the way that training would be. Yeah, that's great, and I think it's probably the only way that it is successful to the extent that you've seen the effects in in the Unilever companies because. Uh, if it's not integrated, then it will always be on the side. It yes. falls more yes. into the art sponsorship and um, kind of cultural mm -hmm. activities for employees type of mm -hmm. thing and not really to transformation of, of culture. And Yes. Um, you also mentioned before that it depends uh, of the type of company, how close the arts feels to the core of the business. Um, mm -hmm. because of course, companies that are more into design um, and into maybe a lifestyle, um, consumer goods, it, art has a closer um, relation to, to the business. Uh, but then the there are elements that are can be transitioned easily from one company to another in this collaboration or this way yes. regardless so which elements would those be they're mostly related to company culture yeah company culture and people everything around people and people development uh, i think is is transferable so let's say you're running a a biotech company uh you're not you're not doing advertising you're not doing pack design so th those uh, easy linkages those trickle down linkages that, that were important to us are probably not at all relevant to you but i'm sure you're facing issues there to do with teamwork to do with uh, priority setting and tough choices to do with uh, one person giving feedback to another to do with program assessment and how, how you discuss that and talk about that how you adapt to change so there's a 
yeah, the, the culture and change management, there's still at least 70% of it uh, would, would be applicable to any, any organization. It doesn't need to be a company. If I was running the National Health Service, uh, I would still be thinking about uh, or be open to the idea that we could use the power of the arts to inspire us to care for people differently and care for them better. Why wouldn't it? There are a million examples uh, in, in the art world that have to do with human health. <laughs> you know, I'm just using that, uh, you know, overusing that uh, particular example. But yeah, people, the arts, the arts are fundamentally about people and it's people that run organizations and work in them. So if you're clever and you, and you get the right support, I think that you can, it's a very fertile territory uh, for insightful analogies to what you're doing in almost any organization. Yeah. I mean, even I've got a son in the army, you know, he's, I was, I was thinking, what's the most ridiculous? Yeah. Could, could, of course. Yeah. Mil art in the military is a huge uh, thing. There's a huge amount of that and the impact of art as a political weapon and, uh, for propaganda purposes and the insight that can be brought into a battle at different levels, the impact on the soldiers versus impact on the geopolitical situation, uh, the sights and sounds and noises. I mean, you could imagine it could be hugely felt. It might be the best possible place <laughs> in the army, it would be the best possible place for them to think about their work in, in a totally different way. So I've just, just thought of that off the top of my head, but I can't think, I mean, the arts are just one of the, you know, one of the greatest forms of human expression. And maybe, yeah, I can't think of any, any field of human endeavor that could not somehow find, uh, be informed by that mm -hmm. and, and be inspired to greater heights or, or different, different heights by the opportunities provided by the arts, which are also well studied. So it's not, you don't have to invent it all as you go along. You know, there are a lot of clever people who've thought about uh, art and they can, you can learn from these people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I don't think it needs to be. It was easier for me because we were in the consumer packaged goods industry. I, I acknowledge that was easier. But now that, now that I've seen that and, and using the examples I've mentioned, I think that I can't, I genuinely can't think of any organization where it would be completely futile. I can't think of any, and actually the arts organizations could benefit from it themselves. <laughs> I've been associated with some of them and, you know, they, they, they could do with looking at some of the great tragedies and comedies of the arts as a way of holding a mirror up to their own chaotic organizations. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the arts are, are a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful, uh, high point of, of human expression. So yeah, I, I would definitely commend it to anybody as, a, as an option if you want to stimulate and improve. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, it's very convincing and it's also very inspiring hearing it from you since you've, yeah, you've seen these experiences firsthand and, and you also saw how it influences other people. Um, one last question, talking about the current context, given that we're having this conversation remotely, digitally, uh, how do you see um, arts in business happening, considering um, this situation? Because, um, well, many of these happen in physical environments. Um, mm also one of the reasons why the arts now are suffering and they they have made extensive efforts in yeah relaunching themselves in a different context but how would you see this working um, in the digital landscape well i would have, i would think i imagine that it's, it's a big it's a challenge and a fascinating challenge without making without making light of the tragedies and the problems that the lockdown is causing so i I'm very worried about that, and that, that's all. That, that's that's a terrible drama, you know. But uh, against the kind of the eighty percent of it that I see as a problem, you know, there is there's twenty percent or twenty five percent where good things are coming out of this. Yeah. And I think that these changes to our lifestyle are themselves a very uh, could be a very fruitful way to explore. In fact, I've seen comedy, for example, um, has really uh, shown its merit in the digital world 
or analysing how, how differently we've all responded. Uh, so I think that it's, it's different uh, and it might be harder, but I think this is where the creative power of the arts should be almost at best effect. Yes. No, matter what you, no matter what you throw at, at the artistic community, they, they'll find a way around it, you know? And you've seen that, some star, new stars have been, have been added to the firmament because of their insight and creativity and use of the different of the, of the digital medium more. Um, so maybe people are distracted. I can imagine that organizations are all, many of them are in a kind of a back to basics uh, uh, situation. But even there, you can bet your bottom dollar, if I'd been running the company with Catalyst in it during this period, I would have seen this as an asset. I would have seen this as a, uh, as a way of reaching out to people, um, getting them to come to terms with what was happening around them, uh, getting them to be more creative in their responses to it. It wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have sidelined it. I would have thought, no, I would have gone to them and said, right, guys, this is the business. We, it was all about a merger 10 years ago. Well, today it's all about how do I keep the communication, morale and motivation of my people in a remote environment? And they, I can, you can bet, they would have come back with some amazingly good ideas, I suspect, about how you could have, uh, how you could have used that. So I wouldn't use it sympathetic as I am for all the, all the difficulties. I don't think it fundamentally changes the validity of, of our argument, which is that the arts can be um, a powerful enabler of improvement in business and organisational design and all the rest of it. Yeah. Thank you so much, James Hill. It's been really a pleasure talking to you um, and uh, fascinating to hear all the anecdotes and the stories that came <laughs> to life from, from your experience. And uh, hope we keep in touch and we wish you all the best to, to your current roles. Thank you very much indeed. I hope, I wish you every success. And uh, yeah, I share your passion in trying to take advantage of the arts to improve the world around us. Thank you. It's nice to find like, like minds out there as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you.